Oh, is that my Patreon? How'd that get there? Huh, so weird. Anyway, yeah, I have one of those. Isn't that crazy? It's got three tiers at varying price points, each offering progressively better perks, and acts as a great way of supporting me. Link's in the description to find out more should you have the money to spare and a heart big enough to do so. What? Get on with the review already? Oh, I mean, I, I, just, I just thought... It... Yeah, okay. Let's take it back to last year when my crosscode adventure started. After being told about the game by one person and viewing a single trailer, I figured that I'd play it on a whim. I mean, what could go wrong? I only just got burned by doing the same thing shortly before. I still have no idea why I'd go out and do something so impulsive, but mayhaps it was fate because all throughout my first playthrough of the game, I had so much more fun than I had playing a single game in a long, long while. I remember playing Xenoblade Definitive Edition shortly before and getting a lot of the same feelings I had playing that game. A feeling that I was playing something excellent, something that really mastered everything I was looking for in an RPG, let alone a video game. But the weird thing was that those feelings were stronger? Did I like this game more than Xenoblade? Nah, ain't no way. This is my first playthrough after all. But why am I referring to it as such? Do I want to play this game again? Yeah, I did, and now after playing it more than once for this video, experiencing the post-game DLC epilogue titled A New Home, and messing around in New Game Plus a lot, I finally feel like I'm able to accept the ways i felt about this game since playthrough numero uno. Those feelings being that CrossCode is one of the greatest games I've ever played, let alone one of my favorites. It shot up on my list of favorites, so much that it even caught me off guard. We've recently looked at Valhalla and Gunvolt 2, and you may have noticed that the Despite praising those games a bunch and at one point calling each of them my favorite indie game, I never referred to them as such in their respective revolutionary reviews. And that's because, well, neither of them hold that title anymore. Yeah, that's right. I love this game so much that it's now what I believe to be the best indie game I've ever played and in my top three. My top three! It was pretty clear I loved this game already, but how did it become a part of the top dogs in my eyes? Well, what do you say we find that out? Let's really dive into CrossCode, see what it sets out to do, how well it accomplishes that, and overall gush about Radical Fish's debut title and an anomaly of a video game. This is my revolutionary review for CrossCode. But before we begin properly, I should let you know that the footage you'll be watching is from the PC version of the game. I originally played it on Switch, but I bought it again on Steam so I could actually play the DLC episode earlier than it would release on consoles. Anyway, no matter what version of the game you play, your eyes are in for a real treat. Yes, this is another Pixel or indie game. Yes, this is another indie RPG styled after the SNES. But yes, this is one of the better looking games in that crowd. The color palette in this game is freaking perfect, containing a flawless blend of vibrancy, saturation, and softer colors as well. The many characters and environmental details tend to pop, but never even slightly too much. Something I found myself really appreciating over my multiple runs of the game. And the background Background art is gorgeous, giving the world a real sense of scale and substance. The game also looks sexy as hell with its frame rate. It chugged a bit on Switch, and running both this game and OBS on my somewhat decent PC gave the game some trouble every now and then, especially in some of the more involved segments late in post game. But this was clearly made and optimized to run at 60 frames per second, most if not all of the time. And my God, it looks so good. As a stickler for the high solid frame rate, this does please me. But the real stars of the show are the ways in which the characters are presented. God, where do I begin? First of all, each character's sprites do their intended design so much justice, perfectly translating their unique and good looks to the game's engine. But on top of this, everyone has a freaking laundry list of animations and ways to express themselves to an extent I don't think I've ever seen before or since. There was never an instance where a character animated in a way that seemed off, and if the scene in question required a reaction from someone we haven't seen yet, then there'd be a new animation to follow suit. This philosophy goes for the character portraits as well, because there were so many poses, expressions, and faces per character. It tends to vary for in-game sprites, but for games that use portraits to tell their stories, I almost always find that a game's just shy of having enough to properly convey the scene's intended emotions at best. But I didn't feel that here. There'd even be some portraits that would have a small animation attached to them, or rarer ones that show up once or twice, really emphasizing the effort placed into them all. You can tell the team wanted every story beat the truly matter and come across as best as they could. It's some great stuff, making for an excellent looking game overall. There's no voice acting, but there doesn't need to be. I know how everyone's feeling at any given time, so much so to the point where even if a character didn't talk, they'd still be able to express themselves more than characters who could. And would you take a look at that? That's exactly the case with our main character, Leah. Leah, Leia, there's, there's no voice acting, I'm, I'm calling her Leah. She's a silent protagonist, but not in the way you're probably thinking. There's an actual story reason for this. See, Crosscoat's main 
main setting is an in-game MMO titled Cross Worlds, and a rare avatar glitch can occur where a player's speaking module won't sync properly and they can't speak. Thankfully, Leah has a guide with her throughout her journey, Sergey. Sergey? Sergey, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Sergey. Who hard codes words into her vocabulary slowly over the course of the game, but it'll never be to the point where she can form complex sentences. For a lot of the early game, her list of words are limited to hi, Leah, and bye, as a matter of fact. But even still, I never found that I was experiencing the frustrations of your typical silent protagonist, because for characters like those, there tends to be no character associated with them. A blank slate to act more as a link between the player and the game. I don't know about you, but for me, I don't need something like that. There are ways to immerse myself into it all without having to make someone whose sole purpose is to get me more into the experience. Just give me a character. Thankfully, Leah has a character, a personality, growth, and development. She has likes, dislikes, sass, a sense of humor. It's just that all of this is conveyed without letting her say it outright, forcing the writers to show and not tell. And all of this makes her a masterclass in characterization, being beyond impressive in terms of how they did it. Leah is a great catalyst for telling the story, delivering on the gut-wrenching, comedic, and heartwarming moments with a consistent level of finesse and quality. I know I probably should have saved this when I talked about the story more, but I just couldn't help myself. Leah's too good, man. We'll talk about the rest of the cast later, because for now, we gotta talk about this OST. This collection of 60 songs is filled to the brim with bangers. To go with the 16-bit style graphics, our composer, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, Denise Akbulut, went with a more memorable melodic soundtrack, and this has always been my preferred approach with cross-code delivering in spades. Every area has its own sound to it without feeling like the songs in question belong in different games altogether. Meaning that yes, every town gets its own theme. Every dungeon has a unique track associated with it. All the areas don't just stick out visually, but audibly. And all the battle and boss themes stick out as well. And there are character themes too? Can a brother get a hell yeah? This soundtrack's excellent, and it really heightened the already fantastic presentation as a whole. And then they went and added even more to it in a new home! Unfortunately, the original composer couldn't return, most likely as a result of making musical magic elsewhere, which is a bit of a bummer, but may. I'm sure whoever they brought in to fill the gap is more than qualified for the task at hand. So let's see, who'd they bring? Steel Plus?! Oh, hell yeah! For those of you who don't know, this king composed the soundtrack to One Step from Eden, and while that game's a whole other can of worms, and by worms I mean gushing and fanboying because holy crap the game's so good, for now I'll just say that soundtrack goes dummy and is one of the most underrated ones this side of the industry. So yeah, this was a pretty good choice for a new home's new composer. There aren't many new tracks, but there don't have to be, because the few here are among the best in an already great album. The Azure Archipelago, man, I could legit listen to that song for hours. The feel good vibes, steel pans, and that piano! Ugh, Steel Plus, you can't keep getting away with this! No lie, this might be one of my favorite games presentation-wise, there's just so much effort placed into every corner. The multitude of character sprites, gorgeous environments, spotless color palette, a soundtrack that's both really big and really good. You know what? Yeah, I'm doubling down on that statement. This is one of my favorite games from a presentational standpoint, up there with the likes of Xenoblade 2, Octopath, and Kingdom Hearts 3. I love the ways it looks and sounds just as much as those, but for different reasons. The story's not too shabby either, despite having a few strange decisions here or there. The weirdest thing about it is its pacing, and I find that to be the hardest hurdle to jump when recommending this game to friends. Leah's story involves her, of course, losing her memory. I mean, she is an RPG protagonist after all. And playing cross worlds will supposedly help her get it all back. So around the first half of the game is doing just that. Playing the game, meeting people along the way, and forming connections with little pieces of her past coming back to her in small intervals. It won't be until about the halfway point where the bigger picture starts playing a more prominent role, and I think that's a bit of a hard pill for some people to swallow. So much of your enjoyment with it will derive from whether or not you like the cast since a bunch of time is just spent vibing with them. But lucky me, that's exactly what I care about, that's all I need! Let me put it all into perspective. My favorite game starts off with a guy who's trying to fix his plumbing. My second favorite game starts off with a guy who needs to get the hell over himself. And my new third favorite game starts off as a humble tale about a girl hanging out in a cool MMO. Characters are the most important part to a story for me. So even if said story leans super heavily on its characters, as long as said characters are great, 
I don't care. And Crosscode definitely delivers in the character department. Oh, and real quick, by the way, if it wasn't apparent enough, this isn't one of those you die in the game, you die in real life types of situations. It's just a setting for the game. Anyway, Golden Cast, let's get into it. Leah is my favorite for sure, but Emily's right behind her. From the start, she left a great impression since she's French, and I don't think I've ever played another game with a French main character. So I love the representation. But her competitive side is super charming. She goes through some subtle yet substantial growth, that of which showcased even better in a new home. And she's gameplay over story? Whoa, dude, that's crazy. Apollo's pretty great too. He started off really funny being such a tryhard in the game and forcing his justice on both Emily and Leah, but he ended up being a really chill dude the more you got to know him. And I don't want to go in on all my favorites, but I love them all. Sergey, my boy Toby, and the mystery girl from the beginning of the game being some other personal favorites. There aren't many antagonists, and they're unfortunately the weaker ones I found, but they don't drag down the whole group enough to be too distracting. And cast aside, when the story does get moving, it's some good stuff. I live on the main conflicts take full advantage of the MMO setting, making for something I've never seen before or since. So in a sense, the pacing didn't affect my experience too much, as I was invested the whole way through. Really, if you don't mind the different approach, you should be able to still squeeze out a lot of enjoyment narrative-wise. In fact, originally, my biggest complaint wasn't even the pacing, but rather the ending, because it felt kinda underwhelming, but thankfully, there was the whole, you know, post-game DLC I keep bringing up plan to wrap up some loose ends and give a more satisfactory conclusion to the saga. Back then, though, when I first finished the game, game before the DLC was released, I was kinda left hanging, and that sucked a bit. Now that the DLC is out, this isn't as big an issue anymore, but I still think that the main game ending the way it did was fairly lackluster. Games that feature a prominent 10 or so hour epilogue still make sure that the main experience feels conclusive in its own right, like Xenoblade or Graces. Crosscode always felt like it just kinda stopped, and while it's a fine enough conclusion, I don't know, I could have used a bit more. But again, this isn't too big an issue anymore because we got a new home, baby! I should mention that this isn't free, costing $10 normally, but I highly recommend getting this if you end up purchasing the game. The extra story bits really wrap up every loose end I wanted addressed, and it brings such a great ending to the game as a whole. I was immensely satisfied from a story perspective, and that alone makes it worth the price of admission. Doing all of the newly added side quests in it, a new home took me around eh, 10 to 15 hours or so to complete, which is a good size, but man. Man, it was so good that I wish it were longer. And a lot of the time is spent actually playing the game, which is great. Give me more, please. Matter of fact, can we just talk about the gameplay already? Look. I love the graphics, I love the music, and those characters did the story a lot of favors. But this is my third favorite game because of how well it plays and feels, so I'm gonna go ahead and get into that. We're already off to a great start because this is an action RPG with some tight, fast-paced combat. You have a melee combo and are able to shoot either with the keyboard and mouse controls or my preferred method, a controller. The twin stick shooting feels way too good, that even when playing this PC version, I didn't want to lose them. Your default kit amounts to a four-hit combo, a charge shot if you want to wait a second before shooting with your alternative being a rapid fire a guard, and a dodge that you can chain three at a time before being punished for spamming and left vulnerable. Pretty short list, but it all feels great. Leah has the perfect running speed, and the rate at which she'll respond to your inputs is just right. And once you know it, this very fact opens the door to some hidden text and capabilities to heighten your experience and learn some more in-depth mechanics. Something that the very first dungeon does a great job in showcasing. Now this room right here has a clear puzzle to solve. It's obvious that you're intended to hit this switch and use the platforms to get across these gaps you can't jump over. But there's a hidden move an option called long jumping, where you jump off a ledge, use your melee attack at just the right time, allowing yourself to dash midair, something you can't normally do, to get more distance and get across this bottom gap you normally wouldn't be able to. If that wasn't enough, you can even do a double long jump, where if you get the timing down even better, you can do two air dashes in midair to gain even further distance, allowing yourself to get across the top gap where even the normal long jump would fail. My other favorite would be infinite dashing, because despite the three dash limit, there's a way to get around this. If you hold the secondary guard button while dashing and time your subsequent dashes to happen after the first frame your guard pops up, the dash count will reset, allowing you to infinitely dash and gain faster movement. This helped me a lot when exploring the game and even on some of the harder bosses, giving me a new method to traverse across the world in future playthroughs of the game. There are tons of things like this, such as dash cancelling, doing trick shots with your charged bullets, perfect shielding and dodging, liking, subscribing, and hitting the bell for notifications. Crosscode ends up being easy to learn, but tough to master. And if you know me, you know that I love that sort of thing. And stuff like this is why it's so important to replay games. Learn the deeper mechanics because this stuff will help you form such a greater appreciation for games you wouldn't have otherwise. Ah, <sighs> replay value. 
Lost art. Thankfully though, you don't need to learn all of these tricky maneuvers to get more out of combat, because there's a lot of customization, skill trees, character growth, and an emphasis on player skill in a way that doesn't require you to know all of this extra stuff that's there for more experienced players anyway. There are tons of pieces of equipment, and it does the cool thing where what you wear isn't simply based on what has higher numbers than another, even if there are some basic pieces of equipment that satiate that desire. The real good stuff, however, are the ones that have certain modifiers and skills attached to them that can help add some variety to your standard battles. Things like having a faster charge shot, a stronger guard, more attack and less defense, health regeneration, things that you'd think about and have to really decide whether or not you want to shift your equipment around. Equipment has a level attached to them in order to help the player get an idea of their power levels, but even still, I didn't always go with like a new helmet with a higher level than I had because I liked the specific attributes mine featured already. This was great, and I hope that many RPGs I experience from here on out feature equipment like this. And the skill tree was fantastic. If it were up to me and this is a nitpick, mind you, I would have some way to get the bulk of skill points, those of which called circuit points in this game, outside of level ups, because while the equipment system allows for more leeway in terms of low level runs, missing out on skills because you aren't getting a bunch of levels is kinda lame. But hey, that aside, there are some great skills and additions to combat that make battles that much more interesting later on, especially when you start getting the different elements in combat arts. So with the way equipment is handled, and with all of these options at your disposal, it goes without saying that cross code is not a grind, nor should it make you feel like you're under leveled. So long as you stay up to date with equipment and maybe do a side quest or two in order to get rewarded some of the better pieces as well as experience and money, you should be totally fine because at the end of the day, the game wants you to win based on an understanding and appreciation for your character's mechanics and recognizing enemy behavior. It's like it says when you start off the game, Crosscode was made with an intended high level of challenge, so don't be surprised if you die a lot. This game ain't easy, in fact, I'd go so far to say that it's pretty tough. Even as someone who did most, if not all, of the side quests, I'd get my ass kicked every now and then, and I loved every second of it. Why yes, I am a masochist, why do you ask? All of the enemies have unique behaviors and strategies to defeat them, with bosses taking this to a whole different level, making fights across the board hella intense. You're probably gonna struggle every now and then, and if it ever gets too much, there are some difficulty sliders in the options, and accessible features like these are always appreciated. But you know me, I'm the kind of guy that really wants to challenge you all, let alone myself, to either get the mechanics or get out. And if you approach crosscode with that mindset, your enjoyment is gonna go through the roof, as it's such a rewarding game to come out on top of. Every death feels like it's my fault, and I always look forward to new enemies, unique enemy combinations, or the dynamic boss fights across the board, whether they be minor or towering over my character. Oh, and the Apollo fights, those kick ass! Everyone always talks about how hard they are, and yeah, my man doesn't hold back. But that's kind of the best part, especially since he's the same class as Leah, so it's a battle of equals. And he uses some arts that you yourself could learn in fun ways, so you can stand to learn a lot from him and the whole back and forth of the fight is so engaging. Apollo, my boy. You did it again. Oh dude, that's great. Now combat may seem like Crosscode's clear biggest strength, but that's honestly debatable. I say this because the dungeons, dude, I mean, damn. There are some smaller ones you can discover in the overworld or through side quests, but the bigger main ones in the campaign are the real stars of the show. And there ain't a single weak link. They're long, but never too much, and always require you to use that brain of yours to solve puzzles and discover secrets. I thought the puzzles started great, but they got so complex later on, and while a few had me stumped for a hot second, I still wanted to push through and figure them out. When I did, that feeling of triumph was euphoric to say the least. Every challenge is so tailor-made to compensate for Leah's abilities she has at that point, requiring me to think about them in ways I wouldn't otherwise, not to mention that a lot, if not all of them, have multiple means of solving them. I found myself approaching puzzles in my second playthrough a bit differently than the first, part of which because of the hidden text I was in the process of mastering, but also because I was just in a different mindset and solved them in new ways. Which is awesome, making for some excellent moments outside of kicking ass. These design philosophies even translate to the overworlds, connecting the towns, dungeons, and such. There's so much to explore and uncover, making something even as frustrating as backtracking a joy, because that means you get to experience even more of Crossworlds. And besides, backtracking is mostly optional. The few times I had to do it barely had me walking through familiar locations because of the great quick travel and pacing to compensate. Thank god. So let's get this straight. The combat is phenomenal, having many hidden texts and options to emphasize player skill, all heightened by well-designed enemies, bosses, and controls. The dungeons are gigabrained, while paced and have different means of beating them. Just the act of exploring is encouraged and rewarded well. Despite my nitpicks, what problems do I have with the game? Really only one, the depth perception. 
Yeah, I found some areas a little annoying to go through because some things would look like they were in one place when really they were in another, but I didn't have nearly as much trouble with this as I did in my first playthrough, so I want to say that the more I play this game, the less of an issue this will become. And believe me, I'm going to be playing this game a lot for a long time because of all of the polish, different ways to customize my playstyle, redoing all of the side quests again because they just add that much, and all of this isn't even mentioning New Game Plus. This is like something I'd see in a Tales game, having so many options allowing me to change up my subsequent runs through points I accumulated through skillful play. In this case, through in-game achievements I really felt like I earned. Bringing over my level, having all enemies skill up my stats to have a good challenge no matter how strong I get. And some dialogue changing based off of what perks I bring? Dude, it never ends! This game just keeps on giving! And a new home's added areas, dungeons, and boss fights? Top notch across the flippin' board! This extra campaign not only features the longest dungeon in the game by a lot, let alone one of the most well-designed ones, but it also features my favorite boss fight in the game, something I won't spoil, don't worry, but man, that was a hell of a fight. The new side quests are all some of, if not the best collection in the game. So they were all a blast to go through. I usually don't bring up optional content in my reviews as much as I am here, but man, side questing is so much fun. Most of them provide legitimate new content, such as unique enemies and bosses, whole extra areas, and reward you handsomely. Very few of them amount to your typical kill X amount of Y or find Z. Even in a few of my new game plus runs, I still went out of my way to do them because they add so much enjoyable content to the experience. I rarely care for even thinking of 100% of my games, but I did every single side quest here and am well on my way to collecting all of the treasure chests and achievements. Kudos to CrossCode for getting me to care for something so out of my comfort zone as much as it does. Like I said in Gunvolt 2, I may call this game perfect in the casual sense, but I don't mean that literally, of course. I more so mean perfect in the ways that matter to me, and that's a status CrossCode reaches. And so, with all that in mind, my final thoughts all culminate not in a statement, but rather, a question. How do they do it, guys? How the hell do they do it? From the beginning to the end to the second end, CrossCode just delivers on all fronts, and this is something I was denying by the end of my first playthrough. I had such a great time that first time through, too much of a great time, and so much of my mind went into thinking about my experience with it after it was all said and done. And by the time this video goes public, the DLC has no doubt hit consoles, but like I said, I played it again before that happened. I wanted to dive back into this game so badly that I went through an entire second playthrough off of the Steam version, not just so I could get to a new home quicker, but to re-experience it all, and it was as if I was obsessed with it all over again, as if I had been going through the game for the first time once more, and I couldn't believe how much enjoyment I was sucking out of it, because it's just, it's just, it's just so freaking good! I can't hold back anymore, I can't do it, damn it, because this is one of the best damn games I've ever damn played, damn! I love Leah, a girl who barely has a vocabulary of 10 words by the end of the game. I love this whole freaking cast and how wholesome everyone's relationships are. I love how so much of the story is spent just chilling with them because they're that endearing, and by the time crap gets good, I'm hooked because these are my babies! I love every combat option at my disposal and how I'm expected to use them all in and outside of battle. I love the dungeon. I love the towns. I love the overworld. I love the emphasis on exploration, encouraging me to look in every nook and cranny, always being sure to reward my hard work. I love the memorable soundtrack. I love how big the soundtrack is, and the fact that there's even more songs in the post-game episode. And despite the main game composer being unable to return, they go ahead and bring in the composer who put together the phenomenal One Step From Eden soundtrack. One Step From Eden! I love that game! And most of all, most importantly, I love that regardless of anything and everything added into the game, the main mindset, the principles behind the design, and the name of the game were all perfectly tailored, unintentionally of course, to my tastes. An emphasis on player skill and mastery of the mechanics. That's it! That's the secret formula and what makes my absolute favorite games my absolute favorites! CrossCode understands that the most engaging combat systems are ones with thoughtful limitations that put the player in a position to truly think about their options at every given moment. Difficulty slider aside, that of which being a great accessibility option, CrossCo demands an understanding and appreciation for the battle system in a way where you literally, say it with me, either get the mechanics or get out. And I love that so much. That simple fact makes this game an endless stream of replayable quality content. New Game Plus is a damn treasure trove of customizable options in order to make future playthroughs different from the last, and more in line with what I'd like out of this game going forward. After spending so much time with the game, both for myself, for the review, and a little bit more for myself, I'm not tired of it. I want more. I want so much more. You haven't played this game yet? Straight up, 
What's wrong with you? There's nothing like it, and that, on top of its sheer quality, has made it quite the unforgettable experience. It's just not fair, man. How did we get this game? What do we do? What the hell do we do? The asking price is a steal, so get it, get the new home DLC, and play the crap out of this game. Do side quests, get lost in the world, dive deep into the combat, and try to learn some of the more advanced techs if you somehow get bored. Because CrossCode will be sure to deliver on all fronts. Understatement of the decade, I love this game. And the simple fact is that CrossCode is a masterpiece. An undeniable masterpiece. God, I'm so lucky to have found this game. I'm also incredibly lucky to have a thumbnail artist as talented and hardworking as Neo. Thank you for another great one. You all should appreciate her as well, meaning that you should hop on Twitter to follow her and maybe commission her yourself if you have no money to spare. And if you have some leftover, mayhaps join my Patreon. Shout out to the ones here already, specifically the $10 Mystic Artists, who go by the names of First Lieutenant Noguchi, Capone Arter Lane, Flaragrar, Kiara Loveday, Mega Saltman, Neo Lab, Noah Steve Appleman and Upscale Wife 417. And much love as well as a kiss on the cheek to all of my bass and burst artists. You are all so appreciated and helped me a tremendous amount. You have no idea. Well, hopefully you have some idea. I'm pretty sure I've been trying to keep you all updated on where the money goes, but you know, you, you know what I'm trying to say. Thank you, of course, for watching and giving me another excuse to gush over and play CrossCode. And as always, so long as you stay hydrated, I will see you in whatever we do next. Probably won't be as good as CrossCode, but I mean, honestly, only two other games are, so it's kind of an impossible bar to overcome anyway. God, what a game. Just play CrossCode already. Goodbye.